If I had a nickel for every single time you guys asked me questions, I would have all the nickels. I would literally have all of them. You have some of the best questions when it comes to planning your wedding, and I'm sure you've come across this moment before where you're like, I just wish I could ask a wedding planner, or maybe it's just me specifically. I wish I could ask Jamie this question about the situation or about what's happening with this vendor, and I know this whole process is so overwhelming. So for those of you who don't know, I actually do a live call with the members of the master plan once a month. And in today's episode, you're gonna see an excerpt of that, of what that looks like, what these live calls are. It's me in real time, it's not a phony pre-recorded webinar. It's actually happening with a select group of people who are in there so I can help them plan their wedding as stress-free as possible on a budget. That's the whole purpose of why I do what I do here on this channel and over in the master plan. So if you are interested in checking it out, I highly recommend click right up here. We keep it super affordable at a low monthly rate so anyone can opt in, get your questions answered, and get your wedding planned. So without further ado, let's just jump right on into it. Hello, hello everybody. If you're new here, first of all, hi. Welcome. These are monthly calls that we do where we ask for y'all to submit your questions ahead of time. But sometimes what ends up happening inherently is more questions will come up along the way. Or someone will say, Jamie, that doesn't make any sense. Could you like run that back through one more time? Or just follow up stuff after the initial questions. What percentage of the wedding budget should go towards catering? So this is something that obviously, as y'all know, will be in the master plan. You should definitely take a peek at that. The budget spreadsheet's my favorite and we spent so much time on this because we wanted to make it really effective and make sure y'all had exactly what you needed to get out of this. So it has the formulas kind of pre-worked out for you. Catering on this we have dedicated to be about 15%. I don't know why I said about. It is 15%. Now, as y'all know, there is give and take when it comes to your catering budget because this one actually has drinks and dessert and rentals broken out separately. Some caterers will lump them all together. If that's the case, you can combine those percentages to give yourself a larger percentage. And some of them have them broken out. I choose to have them broken out on the spreadsheet specifically. So for those who are not doing all-inclusive catering or who are piecemealing some of this together, you have the option of really breaking down how much each category of catering, of food and beverage, should and could potentially cost. What issues should we be thinking about if we want to do food trucks as our dinner option? Okay. Can you tell I'm getting prepared for this one? I love food trucks so much. From a logistic standpoint, I love that they're in an enclosed kitchen. Like we don't have to do a kitchen build out, which most of you probably are gonna not have much experience with or need to have any experience with. But sometimes venues will need to build out a whole freaking kitchen or the caterer will need to like bring in warmers, bring in places to cook things, like r literally build out a kitchen to be able to pull off their service, which if you have the budget, that works out just fine. But if you don't, then that gets expensive. So I like a food truck because it's just, it's literally all the food that you need in a truck. But there are some things that you're definitely gonna need to take into account. First of all, recognizing that they're not a normal caterer, right? Like they might have catered some events, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their timing is going to be as effective as a wedding caterer is gonna be. So what does that mean? We had one event where it was a food truck, they had catered a couple, and it took them two and a half hours from first plate to last plate. That is a very long time. So we wanna make sure that the timing of their food service is as effective as possible. Ideally, I don't really want more than an hour from first plate to last plate. You want it to be condensed enough where it's like no one's really antsy towards the end. Two and a half hours is a very long time. Like for that particular event, we had to get things moving. And then the last people just got their food even later. It was what it was in that circumstance. That's not common, but something that we've got to be aware of. And we tend to run into this more when it's not an experienced catering staff or an experienced catering chef or crew because they're not used to operating in those sort of time frames. Like if you've ever been to a food truck, you place your order and then you wait like 15, 20 minutes, right? Where you're like, it's not a big deal if it's just you and your fiance grabbing a quick snack, a quick bite to eat before going to do something else, maybe at the farmer's market, it's chill and you've got time. Now imagine a hundred people waiting 20 minutes and then all of a sudden it feels like, what's, what's happening here? There's an expectation and there's a speed of service that needs to happen when it comes to a food truck. So asking that question is really important. How quickly can you feed 100 people, 150 people, whatever that time frame is for you guys. A great way of making sure they're more effective with their time is limiting those offerings. It can be very tempting to do 52 different things from the food truck. It's like, it's our favorite food truck. You can pick whatever you want from it. No, no, still break it down to like two, maybe three entrees tops. It's so tempting to add more and more on because it sounds really fun. In fact, we've had clients who are like, I would like to do two food trucks or three food trucks. I'm like, no, 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 ma'am. Cause you wouldn't want to have two or three caterers at your wedding, right? 
you still need it to be more streamlined. And the more options you give people, the longer it can take them to decide or the longer it can take for those items to be prepared. So can we limit it to two or three? And how much of this can the food truck have prepared beforehand to make this process a lot more quick and a lot more feasible? And how long will it take for people to decide? So we need a very clear menu. These are the two options you get, chicken or the beef, you know, or whatever your options happen to be. So we're, you're not gonna be here for 45 minutes deciding what you'd like to eat. We're keeping it as simple as possible. So both instructions for the food truck on that and for your guests, you can have them pre-select, but in a circumstance like this, unless you're passing out tickets, it gets kind of complicated. You can have a pre-selection process and then hand that over to the food truck so they can have a general idea of how much they need to have prepared for your guests. But also bear in mind that people might switch at the last minute. If they see something else in the menu where they're like, oh, that looks, that looks even better. But <laughs> that's when people have the, the freedom of choice in those situations instead of a plated meal being brought out to them. How would you suggest we organize a DIY bar? How many drink options, beer options, wine options, etc.? Okay, so <laughs> why am I introing like all of the questions with this? <laughs> There are a whole myriad of ways and directions that you can take this. There is a whole video that I did on like DIY bar, what Pinterest doesn't tell you because I thought it was a spicy title. But you do have a lot of options and directions you can go with this. For me personally, I think keeping it as simple as possible is going to keep it more stress-free and more cost-effective. So it depends. Do you want to have a really robust open bar? Do you want to keep it simple? Do you need to keep it inexpensive? What is your goal of the bar? What do you want to do? Do you just want to meet the need, get it done? Do you want to get crafty with it? Do you want to land somewhere in the middle? And then you can kind of backtrack from there. So as far as how many mixed drinks options, really and truly, if you're DIYing a bar, I suggest keeping it as simple as possible and saying maybe one signature drink or two. And even better bonus points if they can be pre-mixed. Like margarita or if it's super simple like a jack and coke so it's not like there's no muddling there's no shaking there's no garnishes so the requirement of putting them together is very low guests don't really love having a long line at a bar and i'm sure you probably wouldn't love it either so we want to make sure that the bartenders one can have an easy buy-in it's not a very complicated drink they're not mixologists they're not taking two three minutes per beverage which would be great in a bar setting but not great again when you've got 100 people so it's it sounds simple when you think about it in a regular restaurant, but it gets more complicated when you 100x that service. So keeping it pre-mixed or very simple, low offerings when it comes to mixed drinks, uh, beer options and wine options, I do suggest at least two for each of those categories, a lighter beer and then a heavier beer. So a lighter beer could literally have the word light in it, or it could be something like a hef, or a blonde, or there's a couple of options in that category that would work really, really well. And then a heavier beer, which could be, you know, for the IPA drinkers in your life. I don't understand them. It tastes like hoppy grass. It just, my husband loves them. And I tease him because I'm like, you are literally a walking hipster with your mustache and your plaid shirts and your tattoos and your IPA love. I'm sorry if you do like IPAs, you are totally allowed to have your opinion on that. I just I cannot relate. It's not my thing, but we, I can understand wanting to serve something like that of that nature at your events. You have a couple different options for people. When it comes to wine, at least one red and one white would be a, a good category for that. I also suggest a middle of the road option for both of those. Chardonnay is a pretty safe white, and I would say either a dry, Pinot Noir or a fruity cab is a really great place to stay. Most people will pick a Cabernet Sauvignon. I almost said Sauvignon Blanc because that's the white wine that I really like. It's super good. It's very crisp and refreshing. So Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon, those are names that people can pronounce usually and they feel comfortable ordering them. If you've got connoisseurs in the crowd, or if you are one yourself and you want to get a little bit more variety in there, of course, feel free to. In the warmer months, you'll find people really gravitating towards the white wines, so you'll probably want a higher prevalence of those. And in the colder months, they will gravitate towards the red. White is chilled. Red should technically be at 55 degrees. I don't, I don't abide by those rules, but I know that wine people say them. Is a cash bar worth it to save money? How disappointed might guests be? Okay, so here's the deal. The amount that I have learned about cash bars specifically is very cultural. 
like even across the United States, super cultural. There are some locations that don't care at all. They're like, ah, just do the cash bar. Like oh, they, they bring money without even thinking about it. And there's other locations that are like, you are charging me to drink at your event. How dare you? And it, I would also say it's a person by person basis. So I think as far as the disappointment of wedding guests, you have to gauge how important that is for you. Is it worth spending more money to make sure nobody's disappointed? Or if you just effectively communicate, hey, it's a cash bar and people come with cash or with their credit cards or debit or whatever to pay for those options. You're like, hey, at least we're providing something. That's a you comfort level thing. And that's less of something that I can predict based on your culture and on your location. Because as I've learned, there's a lot to this. Most of the weddings we work are not cash bars, but they're more of a limited DIY or simple bar offering. So it's not a full hosted bar. And that's where you have every mixer, every hard alcohol, every single garnish. I don't recommend ever DIYing something to that extent because the amount of stuff that you'd have to buy is astronomical. And the amount of leftovers you have is astronomical. So I like going with a bartending company for that specifically because they'll have the garnishes and then whatever they, or the mixers or those sorts of things. So whatever they don't use, they then save and use for the next event. Obviously they're pouring it to a drink, nothing's been contaminated. But as for you, in your situation, if you are doing a DIY bar, I don't recommend going full of that magnitude. If you want to have a more robust offering or more offers in your bar, but financially it doesn't, it's not in the cards for you to do a full hosted bar, which is where you pay, where you pay, not the guests, then a cash bar makes a lot of sense. Or you can keep beer and wine free and then anything beyond that you can charge for. There's a couple iterations of this that work better to ease your comfort level and to make it more financially viable for you and to please the guests where it's like, hey, if you want something free to drink, we've got options. If you want Jack and Coke, you're gonna have to pay for it. So is a cash bar worth it to save money? Kind of fall back into the, what I answered with the second question that I answered first. Yes and no. If emotionally you can let go of that expectation of needing to do a hosted bar, then you save a ton of money, a ton of money with going with a cash bar right? Where it's like, hey, that's not coming out of pocket, or maybe you pay for parts of it, but not all of it. Yes, there is a lot of ways that you can save effectively with this. Personally, I think my preference would fall into, I would just do hosted beer and wine only. Like I would pay for beer and wine. I wouldn't do anything beyond that. And then it just makes it a lot more simple. I really, th I think, well, I know we had 140 people. We had leftover wine for ours. And I like using mine as a reference because I know all of the numbers a lot more effectively than some, with some of the, my clients because I don't always get the receipts for everything. I don't think we spent over $500 on alcohol and we have leftovers and we only did beer and wine. So if you really want to save money, keep it simple. Cut down on how much alcohol you are offering. And if you would like to save even further from that, then you could do a cash bar for all the beverages. When looking at all-inclusive venues, what food, dessert, and bar questions should we be asking to keep from going over budget? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> a lot of things on the internet will say, like, watch out for hidden fees. There's this implied intent of maliciousness where, like, oh, we're gonna sneak it on ya. No, you probably just don't know that it's coming, but they're still very common. Let's see, as far as dessert's concerned, is there a cake cutting fee? So that means a lot of times couples will get a cake and then bring it, but not think through who's cutting it and who's plating it and what plate is it going on? Who's providing that plate? Who's providing the fork? Who's providing the napkin? Those elements that you're not supposed to think about because you've never done this before. But if you are expecting your venue or your caterer to cut and plate the cake for you, there is occasionally a service fee that comes along with that as known as a cake cutting fee. Some do, some don't. It could be a very nominal fee. It could be a couple dollars per person. And that tends to come as a surprise for some people. But if you think about it, if you're pulling their staff away from their designated duties of running their catering service and you're adding on an additional service to something they do not initially offer and it's not their product, they're cutting, plating, and taking care of on your behalf, it makes sense to add an additional charge for that in some circumstances. Bar question, is there a corkage fee? And that is, again, for a caterer that doesn't typically supply or a venue that doesn't typically supply the alcohol or you bring in your own. There could be a fee for every cork that is popped. For every bottle that is opened, you could potentially be charged. Again, we're pulling them away from their own duties to perform this service for us. I don't think any of those should keep or should make you go over budget. They typically aren't massive fees. As far as what questions you should be asking to go over budget, I would ask if those fees are in there 
or if there's any fees that could pop up that you might not be anticipating. You also want to look into minimums. So food and bev minimums can just really get people. Let's say you sign up with a venue, they have a preferred caterer, you're super excited, or a required caterer, I should say, you're super excited with, to work with them. And then all of a sudden you get all the quotes and it's like, oh, you have a $10,000 food and beverage minimum. Like I can't go below this. I can't, there's nothing we can do. Like I can't get under this amount. Well, I only have 57 people. How am I gonna spend $10,000 on this? So those are the questions that you'll need to ask with all inclusive venues before you book the venue. Because once you kind of get locked into that venue and then you get locked into required vendors, things start to get a little bit more complicated and a little bit more stressful. So those are the questions. Are these caterers required? Are they preferred? Do we have the option of bringing in our own? And if they're required, or you can only work on their preferred list, which inherently is basically the same as being required, unless they will allow a new person to be approved on their preferred list, which is always worth asking. You need to see a quote before you book because you wanna make sure that you're not getting yourself into a circumstance where, again, there is a minimum. There is the cost per person instead of being like 35 per person is 135 per person. That's kind of information you need to know before you book the venue if you are not allowed to make any choices outside of that. Best desserts to DIY for a wedding dessert bar. Things that are relatively easy and can be made in advance. Okay, I have two videos with this incredible dessert baker who does dessert tables specifically. She may or may not be my cousin. Is it nepotism? No, she's actually really good at what she does. In fact, phenomenal um, and is usually booked out for quite an extended period in advance because she makes really good homemade baked goods and also has a fantastic eye for how to put a table together. It just is so convenient that she happens to be my cousin and I kind of like her. There are a couple of things that you could probably make for your DIY dessert table. That'd be easy. You can make them in advance. The things I think through are what could be frozen. I know some cupcakes and some cakes can be frozen, so it depends on how early in advance you make those. How long they're shelf stable. I'm not a baker. I don't eat lots of sweets. So I don't, and I also don't bake much, so I don't have that much knowledge on that specifically. But what I do have is when it gets to your wedding day, because it's great if it can be made in advance, but how much can be set up in advance? And will it be sitting in the sun? Is it buttercream frosting? Because buttercream is mostly butter that melts. It's keying up how long things stay in a refrigerator before coming out so they don't melt too quickly. Chocolate, will anything separate? Will anything break? And by break, I mean like a sauce or something like that. Like, will it come apart uh, because of the temperature? Bugs are another thing to consider. So I think Amy likes to say at least one chocolate, at least one fruity element. I know she does bite-sized, obviously she does bite-sized pieces, which people love, and then you can really kind of control how much you decide to purchase. When you get full-size items, wait, when you get, we gotta talk about this for a sec. When you get full size items, people will take like a bite of a cupcake and then go back for a cookie or for something else because they want to sample everything. So if you go bite size, it gives them the opportunity to without wasting any food, which inherently saves you money. Best desserts, something fruity, something chocolate, uh, maybe something cinnamony, and then something that's like a crowd pleaser across the board. I would say maybe up to five different types of dessert. If you can keep them small, great. That means that people can sample more and that there's gonna be a lot less food waste. And then things that will not melt in the sun or someone who can set them up on your behalf so they don't get melty and or uh, buggy. I would hate to waste money on excess alcohol. What is, in your experience, the best way to calculate how much alcohol is needed without having a lot left over? Great question, Wendy. There is a drink calculator that's included in the master plan. They're gonna have better numbers than I will off the top of my head for really calculating out how much specifically that you need. Now, one bottle of wine, if it's being poured by an experienced bartender, can serve five glasses. Uh, if you do not have an experienced bartender, like we had for ours, she was very heavy handed and that, it was like half a bottle per glass. Okay, it wasn't that much, but I think she got like three to four glasses per bottle as opposed to five. So there is an element in there of like, make sure who's pouring knows how much to pour because you will see some alcohol waste there. Another way to save on alcohol or to make sure that you're not being wasteful is no table side service at all whatsoever. My guess is most of you probably aren't going to be doing that anyways. And that is when a server comes to the table to offer wine or 
there is wine available on the table, a red and a white. Because you might get one table who totally decimates their white bottle, but doesn't touch the red at all. It's elements like that where you're like, well, it's already opened, so we have to recork it and then transport it back, and now it can't be returned. So making sure that you control the alcohol behind some sort of like professional barrier of someone serving it and not just leaving it as a free-for-all really will help you to kind of control how much is being consumed. And it can also, just as a safety measure, make sure that we're, again, that's not a free-for-all, that people don't have uninhibited access to the alcohol. Don't do champagne pours. A lot of people don't like champagne. I don't understand that. I think champagne's delightful. I think it's very fun. But if you do a champagne pour, people may not want it. And you could waste potentially several bottles of champagne that just won't be drank at all because it'll just be a glass sitting there. Instead, let people cheers and or toast with the beverage that they have available. I also think that places like, I think Total Wine and More, I think BevMo, a couple of places will also help you calculate based on your guest count and based on the offerings that you want as well. So this calculator is really, really helpful. Sometimes it would behoove you to talk to a real person and let them know your desires as opposed to just like a calculator online. So I would say that could be a good call there too. BevMo also delivers, which is fantastic. However, just make sure you have someone above the age of 21 ready to receive the alcohol during the window that it'll be dropped off. We had one circumstance where someone ordered from BevMo and the window was when nobody was there. So they had to like go drive to another location and then come back later for when I was available to sign for it. If you really wanna make sure that you're not wasting any and you don't have a ton left over, see if there's an option or a company that you can purchase through that you can do returns afterwards. Um, as obviously a couple people in the chat have already talked about it, really does kind of cut down on that extra expense and you get some money back in the end. But you have to make sure you can actually get that money back. Instead of cake, we were thinking of doing a pie table. My fiance loves pies and I'm indifferent towards cakes. I have celiac disease, meaning that the pies would ideally be gluten-free. I'm not sure if there are many gluten-free bakeries around my area that would be able to cater the pies. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on DIYing the pies. I'm a pretty good baker and at the moment we do not have other DIY projects. At this point, nothing is set in stone. Just want to explore what options we have. Go for it. If you want to turn it into like your own version of Great British Baking Show, are you kidding? Please, like go on a journey, bake some pies, try it out, have fun with it with your fiance, like turn it into pie night. I don't know, whatever works best for you guys. I think that's really sweet, especially if you don't have a lot of other things on your plate and then you can really kind of make what you would like in this scenario. Don't know what your guest count is. So that makes me a little bit more nervous. You could probably get eight slices of pie so if you have 80 people, that's about 10 pies, because maybe not everybody's gonna have it. Or you can do um, hand pies or small single serve pies as well. But could you feasibly do eight, 10, 12, 15? This is something where you can rope somebody else in. Maybe you make a handful that are gluten-free for yourself and then you can outsource the others. They don't all have to be celiac friendly. Uh, one of my good girlfriends, Mikkel, she also has celiac disease, so I am fully aware of, gosh, every restaurant we go to, every time we hang out, how specific that does really truly need to be. You can't even probably use the same pie server from one, not probably, I know you can't, from one pie to the next. So I would think that start testing it now, start testing the recipes now, also prepare yourself to like yeet at the last minute and book a bakery for the ones that don't have to be gluten-free, unless the intent is like, no, we really wanna make sure every dessert here is gluten-free. If you can, start investigating some of the bakeries in your area, see what options they have, let them know the gravity of the situation, and you can always do a mix and match if you so choose to. If we are going to have cake and ice cream, should I get enough of each for all guests or should I get less? My bakery said I should do 50-50, but I know I have a lot of dessert lovers and I'm afraid of running out of cake. Okay, that's actually a, a great question. I would defer to the bakery on this one specifically. I have never had an event run out of cake. I can't think of one single event that's ever run out of cake. So my guess is you're not going to have 150 guests that love cake or that will eat the cake. Also, when that comes out, it's later in the evening and people are dancing or some of your guests have already left. So I think that there's some wisdom to this. If I had the choice between cake and ice cream, I would probably pick ice cream. So you'll probably have some members of your crowd that do that as well. But if you are truly concerned, do a 60-40 split. Like, let them know like, hey, we, we want a stronger emphasis on cake. Ideally, I, I would love to make sure that there's enough to sustain everyone and feed them a dessert without having too much left over. But hopefully that little tidbit of like, I've never had any issues of running out of that specifically could help. If you really want to make a shift to like 60, 65% cake and then the rest ice cream, 
or if it is a, truly a deep concern of yours, you will probably then need to up the amount, but you will probably have a lot left over. The bakery is most likely giving this suggestion because they've seen this before and they're aware of the feedback they've received from clients in the past. They probably know how much will be eaten. Okay, core and wedding style. My partner and I are having a short intimate ceremony. We live in Colorado, which is a self solemnizing state that doesn't have legal requirements for vows or officiants. So for our ceremony, we are doing hand fasting with our children tying the cords around our hands. That's sweet. We will read our vows and exchange rings with the cords still loose around our hands. Then we will pull our hands out and tie the knot. I love the visual picture of the uniting of our families and my partner loves that it is short and sweet without drawn out speeches and prayers. I'm curious about writing the vows on the wedding programs for guests to read. They're basically the only words spoken during the ceremony and I would love for my deaf brother-in-law to not need my sister to interpret the ceremony for him. But I've never seen vows written in a program. Is it this tacky or too mushy to include in the program? Does it detract from the moment? Alicia go for it. I love this idea, especially because, I mean, man, we're being super intentional about your deaf brother-in-law. We want him to be a part of this experience as well. I don't think it is tacky. I don't think it's too mushy. I think if you even want to take it a step further and offer a little bit of an explanation of like, hey, here's why we're doing what we're doing. We're doing something a little unique. Here's what you're going to see going to be this and then this and then this and here are vows if you'd like to follow along. I think that makes a lot of sense especially because you will probably not be mic'd in this circumstance. It's just going to be you guys and maybe outside. My fiance and I are having a just a four hour reception. No ceremony or cocktail hour. However, we are saying our vows in front of everyone during the reception. Any advice on invitation wording? Do we just say a reception or say wedding on the invite? I would think that well there's no wrong way of doing this. It's not like you can say reception only and then have your vows and people be like, oh, they said reception only. You know, it's, there isn't quite a wrong way of doing this, but one way that you could do this is that you could say, uh, join us for our vow exchange and wedding reception, take place at blah, blah, blah. That would probably be the best way to handle that specifically. I don't know, this is a very unique circumstance. Hopefully that, that phrasing will help you specifically. Buffet for catering, any advice for going into tastings? Oh, wear stretchy pants. <laughs> So I have actual, actual advice for this. I personally love catering tastings. You feel, if you're going with like an all-inclusive caterer that does more than just the food, if they do like plates, rentals, glassware, utensils, etc., it's like an experience. I will never forget the first tasting that I went to as a planner for someone who was going all-inclusive and I was like, <laughs> you want me to come to your catering tasting? Okay. It just felt bougie, okay? They brought out like three different kinds of salads and a couple different kinds of entrees and we passed them around and we took notes on them. I was, it was posh, okay? It was a great experience. And then they left the room for us to kind of have a conversation about it. In this particular circumstance, it was great because the bride and groom were both there. They had both of their moms there and me as well. And no one had too strong of an opinion. So it was a very comfortable discourse. I can understand how in some situations you want to be careful about how many people you invite to these tastings because then the information overload, the opinion overload starts to get to be like kind of a lot. So have a general idea of what you'd like to do going into it. Read the menu beforehand. You might have your preconceived notions just blown out of the water or reaffirmed when you have this tasting. Invite the amount of people that you're comfortable with. Bear in mind that tasting could cost a certain amount per person. So it could be just you and your fiance or it could be you, your fiance and a gaggle of other people, whatever you're the most comfortable with, but it could cost money per person. Sometimes it can be really tempting to pick what you want and that is like the number one influencing factor and other times it's you're pulled the complete opposite direction to be like well I'm only gonna get this if all the guests like it. So that's where those extra voices can come in handy of like providing some reason of it's gonna be okay don't panic about it you don't have to please everybody you can pick something that you want but a lot of the times a couple like barely even taste the food on their wedding day. As much as I try to get them to, I will go out to couples and be like, this is your only chance to eat. Stuff your faces. If people keep coming to talk to you, keep putting food in your mouth. You need calories. It's gonna be a long night. You also spend a lot of time trying to find this caterer. Enjoy the food you spend a lot of money on. But in the grand scheme of things, the guests are probably going to sit down and enjoy their full meal a little bit more than you will. So if you have to err on one side or the other, you could do it just for you guys or you can do it just for the crowd, but I like to see um, a little bit of middle ground, but if you need a deciding factor or deciding voice, opting for that specifically could be really helpful if you are trying to please more palettes, which is why I like dessert tables, because it pleases more palettes as well. 
What would you recommend me to do? In my hometown, we have tradition of the money dance that each guest that want to dance with a couple give them money, but I'm not sure if you should do it or not because of the economy, I don't want people to feel they, they have to do it. What would you recommend? So, okay, so what we're talking about here is a money dance, and if you don't know what that is, it's a where the DJ will cue up a song or a handful of songs. In fact, you might need more than one if you do choose to do one. And the guests will come up and the bride will have like a little purse on her and they'll like tuck the money or uh, maybe into the groom's pockets. Sometimes they actually get really funny with it. I think, did we do the money dance? I think we did. No, we did because people got saucy with it where they were putting the dollar bills on my husband. <laughs> and I was like, that's okay. That would 100% be all his friends went to dance with him. And I was like, it's fine. I'll just stand here and watch my husband dance with all of his best friends. So uh, it's a way of blessing the couple. It's very common in some cultures. It's super, super like taboo in others. And some people fall a little bit in the middle. So Maria, as far as like not wanting to do it because of the economy, if it's something that is pretty traditional in your hometown or pretty traditional in your culture, people will kind of be expecting it. So I think it's just a choice of like, are you comfortable hosting it? Because people will probably want to do it. I love doing it. I love being a part of it. I love knowing that one's coming up. That's just me personally. I love to have an opportunity to bless the couple. Um, if I'm a guest, not if I'm working it. That's weird if I'm working it. But to bless them with a little extra, like a fiver or something, just something financially where they just, they can take cash on their honeymoon or things like that. So I personally don't mind it. I think it's sweet. I think that people, they can be kind of more in charge of their own finances. If they have the freedom to give, then they will and or can choose to do that. I prefer to think with that line of thinking more specifically than not. But if you want to fully remove, then because of where the economy's at or because where your family and friends could be, then don't include it. Unfortunately, my answer is a non-answer or like the response to your question is a question. What are you comfortable with? I think people would still be honored and thrilled to do it, especially if it's traditional and cultural for y'all. I'd say you could probably still go for it. But if your gut sits with it and you're like, I don't think I can. I support that. I support that fully. It's a lot to wade through planning a wedding when you are putting the expectations of other people or your perceived expectations or perceived thoughts of what other people want, your guests, your family members, your friends, onto everything that you're planning. And I know you're not asking for everything. You're just asking for one thing, right? We're not, we're not necessarily asking for the whole kit and caboodle, but this one specific thing feels like a sticking point. I prefer to let people do the people thing and uh, if they choose to participate, they can. And if they don't have cash on them or don't wanna participate, then they don't have to. And that's also where having a good conversation with your DJ comes in handy because then you can say, hey, can we have a couple songs prepared? And if the line looks sad, can we cut it? Thank you. Cause I do not wanna just be standing there waiting and watching all of my husband's best friends dance with them or with him. Um, and then uh, like a cousin in my line. I mean, it was funny. It ended up being hilarious. For those who are feeling a little stressy, I've got you. I am I am praying over you and I hope that peace will just come on you come go come like a like a big you know the weighted blankets? I I, I want a weighted blanket piece for you. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Alright, y'all, I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys!